Okay, I think we're ready to go. All righty. Hi, everybody. My name is Joanne Shango. I am the founder of the Montessori School, Rochester in Rochester Hills, Michigan. I have been a Montessorian for 28 years and have been working in leadership in some capacity or other in Montessori schools for the past 20 years, whether it was as a consultant supporting schools in opening or schools in restructuring or in the founding and operating of my own school in Rochester Hills, Michigan, which services children that are two months of age through grade six with plans to grow into a adolescent program through high school over the next couple of years. I'm also the founder of the Global Montessori Network with Magdalena Panerska, who is here with us today as well. And I am a speaker at many conventions and uh, schools talking about leadership as well as fundamental principles in Montessori education. I'm here with you today to talk about the science of persuasion and uh, we're going to be discussing the different elements it takes to grow your school. We started our Montessori school 10 years ago it was founded and we started with 27 children. We are the fastest growing Montessori school in our area. We exceeded our goals year after year. Uh, by the time we were in year three, we had already exceeded our seven year plan, which we had was the foundation for uh, growing our school initially. This happened not through traditional marketing tactics. We grew our school by being a community and being comfortable with our team members, but also with our families, both those that joined the school as well as those that were prospective family members. So today I'm here with you to share some of these different tools that you can cultivate that you probably find you already have and use with your leading team members as well as with the students that are in your care. And we're going to focus on those tools and how they are used with our prospective families, as well as our current families in continuing uh, enrollment for them. So uh, Robert Cialdini said, a well-known principle of human behavior says that when we ask someone to do us a favor, we will be more successful if we provide a reason. Sim people simply like to have a reason for what they do. And when we talk about choosing a private school over a public school or choosing a different ideology or methodology versus something that's traditionally known and accepted, we need to be able to have a reason and a legitimate reason beyond, I think it's better, to educate and communicate and actually create a relationship with that person in just a couple of minutes because those first few minutes where you meet somebody new, a prospective family, you have a small window in those first two minutes to establish something comfortable with that person so that they can proceed and be open to what it is you have to say to them. As Montessorians, I often say I'm not a salesperson. So persuading somebody doesn't, or selling, doesn't actually feel comfortable to me. However, the art of persuasion is not just for politicians. It's not just for car salesmen or salesmen of any sort. In Montessori, that art of persuasion has to do with effective communication. So Cialdini has six principles of persuasion. And when we look at each of them individually, they may not be super comfortable for us. However, when we look at them as one whole entity together and find a way to perfect them in our own personality, you'll find that there you will receive and achieve much higher levels of success in your communication, but also in your endeavor of growing your schools or your classroom. There is liking, reciprocity, <laughs> that's a difficult word for me, uh, social proof, consistency, authority, and scarcity. 
And using these different methods in your communication strategies with somebody new or a family that you are uh, encouraging to grow with your school is probably the most effective strategies you can cultivate in order to maintain and grow your school. So liking. We all would consider ourselves likable people. However, in Montessori, we often, as a guide, take on the role of being more reserved. The goal is to become invisible in the classroom, right? So that the children are working as if you do not exist after you have introduced the fundamentals. So sometimes that role of observer is perhaps creates a distance between your likability factor. And yet it's really important to cultivate that idea of being likable. When somebody comes into your school, the first thing you want to be able to do is share a warmth and a comfort, something that tells them I can talk to this person, creating that culture of likability in your school, not only with yourself, but with all of the guides that are in your school. When you think about programs like, I'm sure all of you have heard of the Tupperware party, and there's so many variations now in this day and age of the Tupperware party. Studies have shown that many people, when they attend that Tupperware party, the premise of the Tupperware company was based on likability. People were found, neighbors were purchasing more from the neighbor that they had a very good, strong, friendly relationship with than of those that was more of a stranger to them. So the friend of the host might purchase more than the friend of the friend because that person doesn't necessarily have a relationship or a feeling of likability, liking that person and investing in them. We we want to cultivate with these new people, and again, that really short window, and it happens authentically in the first couple of minutes that you work with them, is that idea of this person saying, I trust you, I like you, I admire you. And when they have that feeling of ease, they begin to breathe. And when they begin to breathe, they are more receptive because they are feeling already that they're with somebody that they can trust. Because if you like somebody, that usually leads to a subconscious feeling of, I can trust them, they're honest. And people repay in kind. That's a second principle in reciprocity. Uh, research confirms that people tend to treat you the way you treat them and to cultivate that community in your school, particularly with people that are just coming in to know you. If they feel that you respect them, you've developed a communication that says, I respect you, I understand what you're going through. Cultivating and asking those questions, which maybe we tend to stem away from, but what is it you're looking for, right? That's basic. Where are you currently? Why did you choose that? What's causing you to change it? And to actually address those questions in the manner of not for you to acquire data, but for you to gain understanding, allows them to see that you like and respect them as well. And that in and of itself will open a communication that allows you to do something different than sell your program. What happens at that point when you develop that feeling of, reciprocity. <laughs> I'm going to giggle each time I say that. Uh, when you develop that back and forth relationship with uh, this prospective family, what you are providing now is the opportunity to no longer sell, but instead educate based on their needs. And that's what we do, right? That's what we specialize in as Montessori educators is to guide and to educate and to be able to do that where the family doesn't feel or doesn't need to feel that they are one entity and another entity is trying to sell them something that they may or may not want. Instead, you've opened a communication that allows them to seek. And as they are seeking, you are able to guide. 
people follow the lead of those uh, who are similar to them. I'm often in my tours with families, uh, both prospective as well as returning families, relating myself to situations. And that's not, e that's not difficult to do. It's actually very easy. If you look back on all of the different authors and different writers, blog writers that are out there, it has become a trend where they relate their own experiences, whether it's a psychology based article or it's a parenting article or an education article, they often refer to themselves because we are, as writers, as leaders, being able to relate to situations allows parents to understand that one, they're not alone, and two, there is a full depth and breadth of the understanding of you as the leader welcoming them in. So in uh, even a first tour, as they're discussing the challenges or the goals of their children, I'm often relating it to experiences that I've had either in the classroom with other children or even with my own family. And that might feel vulnerable and it might feel too personal. However, it's very important to feel confident enough to share those experiences so that they have that relatability. Social proof. All your neighbors are doing it. That's for Montessorians possibly a little bit uncomfortable. And yet, if we really and truly believe in Montessori, what we actually want is for it to become a movement that is just accepted. So to be able to relate to other members of the community, to be able to relate to people that they may know or see or have some relation with, whether it's the famous musician that sent their child to Montessori where they already feel a relatability to them just because, you know, there's that idea of socialization through media and you feel invested in this person that comes into your home through your radio. Uh, there, there is something very tangible in being able to say everybody else is doing it. In Montessori, if we are, as Montessori schools, able to grow at an, a rate and an extent to meet the needs of whole communities through individual children, then we really need to develop that idea of social proof. Montessori is not just a want for a select few. It is a need for many, or dare we say most, families. It's something that is just done. And we really want to cultivate that experience, that belief, and that foundation so that what we do in our Montessori schools becomes even more widespread and we stop having to sell why they should choose Montessori over traditional schools or over public schools or whatever the case might be for your specific uh, school. It is to already have the notion of we're choosing Montessori. Now it's just which one. And that is possibly, in my personal opinion, the most valuable tool that we can cultivate as we develop these relationships with our prospective families. Consistency. People stick to commitments made publicly. And I will use a situation to relate this to you. For years, I have talked about opening an adolescent program, and it became something people only heard because it happened intimately in conversations at the school. It was simply something I wanted to do. It wasn't something that necessarily had a timeline and a real, it never became tangible. And with Magdalena, when she joined us, we put a date down. And putting that date down was terrifying. And we gave ourselves a two-year window. And yet, when we were able to make a commitment publicly, make a press release, be able to stand by the fact that in two years, we would indeed be opening a adolescent program, that commitment publicly had the buzz and the interest of not just an idea, but something solid. And when it becomes solid, when you 
make your commitments publicly. When you know your voice and your voice stays consistent, whether you're speaking in your school or you're speaking to families or you're speaking to a community at large, whether it's at a barbecue or it's at your local uh, BBB, uh, Better Bin Business Bureau Association meeting or things like that, having the ability to make those commitments and stay consistent in your voice removes the uncertainty of the success of your program long term. That is what takes you and your program and therefore the words that you give in your tours a foundation that would then be unshakable. There is no question of if the Montessori school is still there in two years and instead in two years, this is where we will be going. That, that becomes foolproof and that takes that commitment to consistency in your statements. Be true to your word. If you're going to make those statements, you also have to work towards them. Going back to that same example, about three months ago, right before all of this crisis occurred and, and the stay at home orders happened and our school was closed, I was speaking with somebody and I was being true to my word and I was consistently explaining that we were indeed opening the adolescent program in two years. And then I stopped and I looked at him and said, Actually, it's now one school year. After this upcoming school year, we will be opening. It's in 2021. And I took a huge gulp. I was like, oh, wow, we have a lot of work to do. And yet, because I made a public statement, I have to begin planning and making sure that my statements about who we are as a school are sound, that they never vary, that I do not change the timeline unless I have proof that the changing of the timeline only makes the plan better. But if I'm constantly putting it off, then there's an uncertainty about the statement that we make and therefore we are not authentic to our words. So we want to make sure that even as we vocalize and speak about what we do, that we're actually doing it as well. We have to be consistent in our actions and in our plans so that when that visitor comes in, there isn't a question of, well, I heard, is it true? Instead, they're coming in and saying, I'm coming to you because you're going to have or because you do have. And they have a certainty in their trust in you based on the certainty and trust that the community at large has of you and of your school. Having authority. That is something that in Montessori schools, having that feeling of authority in our classrooms, we have it, but we, we develop an invisibility in our authority, in our classrooms. And yet as leaders, to be able to have that authority and have people look to us, to defer to us as experts in trust, because they can not only relate to us, they not only like us, but they also trust that we are able to lead through crisis, through growth, instability, with joy, in comfort, in education. And so it's very important to be comfortable in your role of authority. People want to know that there's an expert. When I first founded my school, I had spent so many, 10 years prior, working strictly as a volunteer expert in Montessori education. So when it came time for me to open my school, which necessarily wasn't necessarily a concrete plan, but always something in the back of my mind I knew I wanted to do. When it came time to open the school, I already had a position of expertise. It wasn't just the years that I spent in Montessori. It was my comfort and my belief and my confidence in what it is I had to say about Montessori education, about child development, about relationships, about social emotional growth, about academics that allowed me from day one as I opened our doors 
as we even began planning two years prior to that, to establish myself comfortably in the role of expert. And when you veer away from that authority, and you begin to trust others more than you trust yourselves, you put yourself in a very precarious position because collaboration doesn't mean trusting others more than you trust yourself. It means trusting others as much as you trust yourself. It means making difficult decisions in that position of authority that says, I do hear you and this is my basis and this is where we're gonna go. And if you are confident in that, you can not only receive and adapt as your journey continues to grow, but you can also maintain relationships with people new to your community, as well as people that have been with you for years, that they trust in your expertise that your decision may be different from theirs. For example, a prospective parent can come in, but they trust you. They understand that your school is the authority on Montessori education, that you have the years, the experience, and the depth and breadth of knowledge in educating children, that when they come in and say, I think the class size is too large, that you can recognize their concerns, you can relate to where those concerns come from, in regards to what is known to them in traditional schools, and then speak with authority of why the decisions you've made in your school are not only are not just different from what this prospective parent might know or understand, but are actually something that they can have confidence in and follow you with in growing your school. scarcity. People want more of what is less available. I will tell you, as a Montessori school, this is the most challenging for me. I always want to have room. Years ago, we were in year three. Our, uh, we were at our seven-year capacity, what we thought we would be reaching in seven years, where we knew we were going to grow. And in the third year, we were at capacity for our building. And somebody said to me, wow, what an amazing problem to have. It's actually an exciting place for you to be, to have a wait list, to have that feeling of it's not available. You have to get on that wait list, right? You have to, as soon as you have your baby, you have to be able, you have to get your name on the list so that your child could have that school because it is something people want. They think if there's not a lot of availability, Ability. If it's that high in demand, it must be something special. And yet that had me nervous because as a businesswoman, I was looking and saying, if we've reached this growth in three years and our best projections, as well as our most conservative projections, put us at seven years, then we haven't hit our capacity. So we have to continue growing. And thankfully, we did continue growing. But I had to begin to challenge that mindset. I didn't want to be, oh, I'm the only Montessori school in our area because that defeats what I believe Montessori should be, which it should be in every single school. I wanted to keep growing. We did. We went from one classroom to four primary classrooms. We went from one infant toddler combined eight student room to four infant and toddler communities, as well as a growing elementary school. It was hard to wrap my head around the idea of scarcity. People want more of what is less available. And to be able to wrap my mind around it and for you to wrap your mind around it, to be able to have the words that say to a parent, especially a prospective parent, well, there's only two places, two spots left for the fall. And to be able to stand by that and let them feel the urgency, and let them feel the demand that your school already has. I always want to move on with, however, we might open another classroom because there's a part of me that thinks I want them to understand and know that we're growing and that we will always meet the needs of our community. But over the past couple of years, I've learned to bite my tongue on that. And instead, I've talked about the growth that we have had 
and how even with the fast paced growth that our school did achieve in the first 10 years, that we are still in demand and there's limited availability. And I initially thought that that would turn somebody away. Well, I don't wanna make a quick decision, so I'm gonna keep looking and possibly not come back. That was my fear. And what we found is the opposite. They're looking and saying there's two spots not next and they have an urgency to get what it is you're given, particularly based on everything else I've given them in my communications on that tour from the first two minutes when they walked in the door where I developed a relationship of likability and a relationship of we are the same, you are not alone, I experience what you're experiencing. So when you use these principles, make sure that they are used for good. When we talk about the art of persuasion, we think again, going back to that politician and going back to that uh, salesman, we think that there's a manipulation, right? They're selling us. You still have your ethics, you still have your integrity, and you are using these tools not to create a false impression or to only cinch the deal, and instead, you're using it to cultivate the relationship that for Montessori schools is critical. We want them with us for that three-year cycle. And if we have elementary programs, we want them with us for the next six years as well. It needs to be a long-term relationship. Therefore, you have to be honest and full of integrity, have ethics in your word and maintain them. So when you put them all together and you think of liking, reciprocity, social proof of who you are, consistency in your word and in your actions, the authority that you have on your specialty in Montessori education, and the scarcity of your program, the fact that your program is so great and services so many, but in all reality can only service, educate, love, and guide so many students for the nature of the size of your building. When you put all of those things together and move forward in an honest communication of your school and of yourself, you can only experience a growth in your school. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Joanne. We have two minutes for questions. Um, if you have any questions or comments, um, you can put them in the Q&A box or you can just put them in the chat box. We are happy to answer them. Um, the presentation is being recorded. Uh, we uh, It will be available for review along with the slides and um, also the audio. Uh, tomorrow morning on our website. Um, and um, I see we have a question. Okay. And you're all very welcome. Uh, I see the thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. We're uh, um, presentation right on the spot, uh, spot on uh, that. So we always love to hear that. <laughs> Nicole, honestly, the growth that we've had in our school using in a very natural way, I believe that this is just who I am and who most Montessorians are. But to be able to use them with deliberateness, to understand these different tools and these different facets of our, our personalities and how they can apply to the preservation and the growth of our schools is really extraordinary. What we've seen in the past couple of years as we've moved in this manner in a more conscious way, uh, really transforms the whole community, not just the growth of your population. Thank you so much, everyone. And uh, we'll see you next Wednesday at one o'clock. Awesome. Thank you all very much. Stay well, stay healthy, stay focused. And I hope all of your schools open soon and uh, experience stability and growth.